Okay, so uh, as Christian said, I've been around for quite some time, so probably my introduction will be uh, very basic for most of you because I gave this talk at some point to a broader audience. But uh, just to set the context of what we are going to speak today, by the way, the talk is going to be rather light as the one Vladko gave uh, one month ago, different type of lightness. But um, So the context is the famous statement that you find in any textbook devoted to quantum physics that the outcomes of a measurement do not pre-exist the fact that the measurement is performed. And uh, if you look back in history, probably the first evidence of uh, this statement can be uh, attributed to the Heisenberg uncertainty relations because indeed uh, these relations say that not all physical properties can have sharp values at the same time, which means that if I measure one of the others that doesn't have a sharp value, then uh, um, the, the result, well, is not predetermined. Now, why this is not the end of my talk and why this has not been the end of many debates, it's, uh, well, there are many reasons for that. One is the stubbornness of some people. The other is that uncertainty relations can be interpreted, should not be interpreted, but can be interpreted as imperfection of the measurement procedure. You remember that Heisenberg himself, when uh, asked to explain this thing to a large audience, he wrote his book, a popular book about this, and then he introduced the famous Heisenberg microscope that is a semi-classical description of how uncertainty arises, which is a perfectly fine phenomenon, but is not what is meant by Heisenberg uncertainty relations. Also, testing uncertainty relations is a very tricky business because you can easily violate uncertainty relations by a badly calibrated device, right? If you don't believe me, just think that you forget to turn it on, right? So your, your device measuring mom momentum is stuck at P equals zero. So delta P equals zero, right? And then delta X delta P is equal to zero. So you say, well, this is absurd. Well, it's absurd, but it shows you that you need to calibrate your devices very, very well in order to claim that you have verified or checked the uncertainty relation. By the way, it's very hard, as you know, in science to check a negative statement. Like, I cannot do better than this. Hmm? You know, try to, uh, those who have children, right, uh, come back and, I cannot do better than this in the exams. Okay, right? <laughs> um, so the conclusive evidence that, uh, I mean, up to interpretational matters, that uh, outcomes do not pre-exist is the violation of Bell inequalities. Uh, what is this? Well, I will not even write down a Bell inequality today. I think most of you know what it is. Those who don't know, well, can ask me later. Um, the ideas here are that the experimental imperfection cannot fake a violation of Bell inequality. The detection loophole, yes, but forget about this for the moment. It's theory independent, so it does not rely on the quantum formalism. You need the quantum formalism to know that delta x delta p is larger equal than, for instance, h bar over 2. It could be h bar over 4, right? it could be delta x larger than something. Why should be a product of two things? Huh? So here, the Bell inequalities do not depend on the quantum formalism, depend in fact on the classical worldview. They capture the classical worldview and quantum mechanics falsifies that worldview. It's what is called device independent, namely it does not derive on a description of what is being measured. Position, momentum, spin, atoms, photons, B, C, whatever. If you see a violation of Bell inequalities, you know something. You know that there is entanglement there. You know that there is something non-classical going on, irrespective of any description of the physical system and the degrees of freedom under study. It's called Bell inequality because it's been first noticed by John Bell in 1964, although you can find Bell inequalities in a treatise by Boole in the 19th century. But he presents these as conditions that obviously any probability distribution must satisfy. Because he couldn't imagine that in nature this thing would be violated, right? Um, and as you know, there are plenty of experiments have been uh, performed since the, the first conclusive one is traditionally the one of Alain Aspe and co-workers in 1982. And then uh, there have been many, many, many until uh, two years ago, there were the, one year and a half ago, the report of what's called the loophole free uh, Bell test in Delft, Vienna and NIST plus several collaborators. So that's the story that Either you trust me or you know, that's not the story I want to tell you. Uh, I want to focus on the fact that measurement do not reveal pre-existing properties is a pretty strong statement. 
it might be the reason, I don't know, we can do a sociological test later, it might be the reason why many people are still uncomfortable with quantum physics or the quantum physics hard to explain. Um, in fact, it has also given ri rise to a lot of discussions, more or less focused, okay, for instance, uh, okay, you can speak of local hidden variables, you may ask why hidden, why local, because quantum physics is not local, no, quantum physics is local, but the realism is false and whatever, all kind of other stuff. Uh, well, these are pretty civilized discussions, contrary to what we could have had, right? Um, but, um, okay, fine, these are things that, uh, that I made up, just for the record, right? That uh, is, is, is fake news, okay? Um, fine, so, uh, so that's the situation. And so 1964, John Bell, 1982, Alana Speber, in those years, right, this was more or less a situation. This is a, the most uh, chaste representation I could find of uh, Ulysses and the sirens, uh, the, the, the mermaids, right? Uh, so the mermaids here are represented as these birds, and these are P, as we call it in, in Italian. Um, so, okay, you have the, 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 the physicists trying to steer physics ahead, right? And then uh, people interpretation come in and try to stop them by showing them how absurd is what they are doing. And the uh, usual attitude has been summarized as this, no, shut up and calculate. It's a bit, a bit dis, uh, despising slogan, but it captures a little bit the attitude of many physicists of saying, look, don't discuss too much about these interpretational issues. It doesn't matter. This theory is fantastic. It predicts plenty of stuff. Just compute. You get the right results. That's it. At some point, of course, there's always been something. I'm simplifying quite a lot, right? But at some point, the people that we now associate to the beginning of quantum information started asking questions in a slightly different way. So, okay, yes, fine. Yeah, yeah, I want my ship to go ahead. I don't want my ship to get moored there in between the, the two different um, cliffs and whatever. But still, I would like to listen to what these people are saying, and maybe something useful will come out of that, right? Okay, you know the story. The first thing that uh, came, turned out to be useful is this one. Measurement modifies the state. Our favorite one for the talk of today is, uh, well, somewhere there. Right? It's, it's not written as I normally phrase it. Anyway, measurement modifies the state, as you probably know, all of you in this audience, is uh, used as the main idea behind quantum key distribution which is not a very modern topic today, right? Uh, so I, maybe I summarize for those of you who are younger. Uh, in quantum key distribution in the bennett Brassard 1984 protocol, Alice has a source of light, ideally single photons, and sends a qubit, for instance, the single photon encoding polarization to Bob. Alice can prepare four possible states, and Bob can make, perform two possible measurements. And the uh, uh, table of statistics is such that uh, ideally, right, if there's no error in the chain, whenever Alice prepares plus Z and Bob measures Z, well, he gets the result plus, minus Z gets the result minus, and when Alice prepares plus X or minus X and Bob measures Z, the results are random, and similarly in the other column. And where does measurement modify the state come into play? Because in, uh, the, the idea is that there's a character missing here if the eavesdropper is trying to learn what the coding is. Oh, by the way, plus would code here for zero, minus for one. So that's, uh, that's the bit, the bit, uh, the coding of the bit. Uh, so if he's trying to learn whether Alice is sending a plus or a minus, but since there are two possible forms of plus and two possible forms of minus, and the two measurements cannot be performed at the same time, so this property does not pre-exist, but here is more, uh, if trying to learn the thing will have to measure something, and by measuring she modifies the state, and as a result, Alice and Bob will not see this perfect table. In particular, we'll see some uh, mixing here. So great, I mean, these uh, can be used. And uh, now we we'll go to our favorite topic, outcomes do not pre-exist. And this is the way Arthur Eckert phrased quantum cryptography in 1991, with now a source of entangled qubits. So the source is in the middle. OK, you can put it on this side, um, or in Bob. So there are these now two qubits fl flying, one to Alice, one to Bob. And then uh, let's read what Arthur has written in the paper. The eavesdropper cannot elicit any information from the particles while in transit from the source to the legitimate, legitimate users simply because there is no information encoded there. 
Now that's the idea again of violation of bell inequalities tells you that the outcomes were not pre-existing. If they were not pre-existing and there is an eavesdropper asking for them here, well, there's nothing to say, okay? There's nothing to read. Again, on the, on the Eckert protocol, you can do the same thing. If, if the eavesdropper tries to learn something, uh, she can learn something, but she will modify the correlations. Notice that at the time when Arthur wrote the paper, the eavesdropper was a male. Cultural uh, statement. I haven't studied when the eavesdropper became female. Pretty early though. Now you may say, oh great, that's the end of the story, right? So we have a use for the statement outcome do not pre-exist. In fact, well, I didn't write it here, but Arthur really used Bell inequalities in this paper. So he really says the Bell inequalities. Like, uh, so what am I going to speak about in the next half an hour? Well, something strange happened. Not strange, or interesting. Um, Bennett Brassa and Mermin came together just after uh, Eckert's result, and they noticed one thing. They noticed that the protocol of Eckert is essentially the same as the BB84 implemented with entanglement. And the idea of the translation is pretty simple, is you put everything here in Alice lab, and this could be the way by steering, right, uh, Alice prepares the state of Bob. If Alice measures, let's say, a singlet state, if Alice measures in the X basis, she finds minus X, while she has prepared plus X on the other side, okay, condition on the, on the knowledge of, of Alice. So it seems that this is just another way of seeing the thing. And indeed, here we are, the correlations are the same. If uh, Bob measures, Z, Alice measures Z, Bob measures Z, they get either both plus plus or both minus minus. And when they measure in different bases, they get random results. So fine, this was a very important result. I will just give you uh, one slide on theoretical QKD, just for those who don't know, I could speak of this for hours probably, but, um, so this translation from prepare and measure to entanglement base became the canonical tool to, rule, to run what is called unconditional security proofs. Where unconditional security has a particular meaning that I will tell you later. Um, the first such proof was Dominic Myers, 1998. Nobody understood it. Uh, Shaw and Preskill, 2001. Everybody understood it. Uh, and uh, the definite framework is by now the one of Renato Renner developed in 2005 to 2007. So we all used in those years, I came in that field around 2003, uh, we all used those tools, th th that, th that translation that entanglement based and prepare and measure are sort of the same thing. And we run the proofs in the entanglement based scenarios is simpler mathematically and conceptually and then we say, well, it's the same thing in the other one. So this is what unconditional security means that quantum key distribution is provably secure against the most general attack of the eavesdropper uh, as expected, because security is based on the laws of physics. Uh, I have to specify that the eavesdropper is supposed to be between Alice and Bob, that is not supposed to hack the, uh, in, these, in these statements. So it's not unconditional in the sense that nothing can happen, right? It can happen hacking, for instance. Uh, I, I, these proofs always suppose that Alice and Bob are perfectly isolated in their labs. So, that's what I was told when I went to my first conference in Gdansk 2002 in quantum information. And I think Reinhard Werner or someone of that caliber came to me and told me, why are you still working in Bell inequalities? Well, he had just published a paper on that, by the way, but um, I mean, come on, right? These local hidden variables have been falsified. Forget about it. We have to work on entanglement theory. And that's, that's the future. And this is like the golden years when the Horodesky family had just proved bound entanglement, all this stuff, right? So for application, we don't need them. It's just to shut up the unbelievers. Really, quantum mechanics is correct, or at least is not so wrong. Classical physics is wrong. Forget about it. So that's it, Bell inequalities to the museum. I don't know how many of you know this, this movie, by the way. So it was a cult movie when I was young. Um, OK, but something happened. And what happened is this. In 2006, these three people write a paper, very complicated one, but there is an element in that paper that I want to bring up, and it's the following. Now, look at this table of predetermined values. So here, imagine that this is not a qubit as in the quantum sense, it's a carrier of information, and in the carrier of information, it can carry two bits, 
bit AZ and AX going to Alice, bit BZ and BX going to Bob. So it must be dimension four, okay? And look at this encoding. So sometimes this is plus plus, and this is also plus plus. Sometimes this is plus and minus, and that one is also plus and minus, and so on. That's what this table means, okay? Now look at the correlations. When Alice and Bob measure the same, they get the same. When Alice and Bob measure different bases, they are completely randomized. And this is what I called before the ideal correlations of BB92, so BB84. So, I hope you are a bit in, now there's something wrong here, right? Because this is local hidden variable. This is pre-established. This is re if, if the eavesdropper reads this guy, the two values are already present. Every, nothing quantum here. How can this be unconditionally secure? W what mistake has been made? It cannot be. Okay, in fact, no mistake was made, right? I, I, I hinted to the solution. Maybe some of you know it. The solution is that I need dimension four. So if I, if I add the, the assumption that the source produces qubits, bits, dimension two, there's no way I can run such a local hidden variable model with bits. So all the security proofs before, including the translation BB, uh, uh, ECR91 to BBM92, were made under the assumption that everything is qubits. which is not easy to check. Even an optical mode, you say, yeah, polarization of a photon. How do you know that the two polarization are in the same optical mode? If they are not in the same optical mode, it's no longer a qubit. A photon, an electron, anything, is an infinite dimensional hit of space. So you need to trust very well your coding in order to make that assumption. Besides, it, the, another assumption of the proof is that the measurements are complementary bases. That one can sort of be dispensed with. So under those assumptions, then it's true that BBM92 is equal to E91. It's true that we have unconditional security for those correlations and so on and so forth. And now the natural question is, um, well, Bell violation, the thing of Eckert, is device independent, so doesn't need these assumptions. Can we run a security proof now based only on the violation of Bell inequality and not on these assumptions? And the answer is yes, we can. Sorry for the constant reference to American politics. I should have used French politics, but it's less exciting. Um, and this is the, the paper where the use device independent was used for the first time. In fact, it's uh, 10 years ago, more or less. Um, and uh, well, I mean, uh, there's no need to read the abstract. That's what it does, right? Yeah, it's the 10th anniversary, more or less. In fact, when I gave this talk, it was exactly the 10th anniversary. So that's the story I told you so far. There was a... Okay, there's cryptography and there's Bell. For the moment, pretty empty here. At the intersection, Ecker 91. We move away from the intersection very fast by BBM 92 saying, ah, we don't need this thing of Bell. It's the same as entanglement. It's the same as BB 84. This gives rise to all the security proofs. And then later there is a revival by this remarking this thing that I told you that the ideal BB84 correlations are local in the sense they can be done with classical variables and the device independent paper. And there's an, a curved arrow here because there is another part of the story that I need to tell you. So the question is, where did this guy get the inspiration? Out of their genius? No. There was a whole story behind and it's a very strange story. It's the most nonlinear story I can imagine to get to this result. That by the way, was already here. So, to recover the intuition of Eckert, it took a very, very nonlinear way, and here how it went. So there is something there, I will tell you what it is. There is a popescu Orlich paper, and then there was some stuff in between, and then uh, a BHK Barrett Hardy Kent. Okay, so what's, what is this? Uh, well, there is another source of inspiration I will mention later, Meyer Siao, from the cryptography side. So in order to tell you what that side of the story is, I need to introduce a notion of no signaling. So no signaling is a notion about resources, and resources are the following thing. I share something with one of you now. We go apart. Can we use that something to send a signal to each other? So uh, no signaling means that whatever we shared cannot be used to send a signal. 
Uh, let me give you a simple example, okay? We share uh, a classical list of bits. So if I share with you a classical list of bits and I go to my office, I can do whatever I want with my list of bits. I can read it, I can burn it, I can eat it, <laughs> I can erase stuff. Nothing will happen on your side. Your list will be perfectly intact, okay? Now, as it turns out, with entanglement, it's exactly the same. If we share a pair of entangled particles, and I go to my office and I measure one and I clone it or whatever I do, on your side, nothing happens. Okay, so it's also a no signaling resource. Um, so sorry, that what happened here? No, that's one. <coughs> and uh, you see why it, this is interesting? Because if you think of the violation of Bell inequalities, the violation of Bell inequalities or any establishment of correlation is completely trivial if communication is allowed. You can think a little bit, right? Now, I want you to reply this if I receive this input. Well, I, I call you and I say, I receive this input, please reply as I want, right? That's as simple as that. But what is amazing somehow why we are so surprised by the evolution of Bell inequality by quantum physics is that it's violated without signaling. And the famous argument that any signal should travel faster than light and this cannot happen, right? So that's why the violation of Bell inequality with quantum system is sort of intriguing. Because there's no signaling going on, still if we were to simulate it classically, we would need signaling. So that's where the popescu rolish paper comes in. So in uh, 1994, Sandu and Daniel asked the following question. Maybe the violation of Bell inequalities without signaling is the defining feature of quantum physics. If I, maybe if I say this sentence, mathematically it can only be realized by a Hilbert space with operators, algebras, and whatever, sister algebras, all this kind of generation you can think of. And they, uh, the answer to the question, no, it's not. There is something that is no signaling. You can write it down mathematically, but it doesn't exist in our world. They, we call it a PR box nowadays. Of course, you can find, the, from Popescu and Rowley, of course, you can find that it has been invented far before. There are, it, the PR box has not been invented by them, but whatever. Um, and it's this set of correlations. I can tell you later what they are. But that's it. So bottom line, there are some objects that you can think that would be a no signaling resource that are not available in quantum theory and as far as we know are not available in our universe. And if they were, a few strange things would happen, by the way. Okay, so uh, that's not the principle. Uh, here are the references if you want to know who invented the PR box before Popescu and Rorlich. Uh, and here is where these three guys Barrett, Hardy, and Kent came up with a completely crazy idea. And the idea is the following. Suppose now that, you know, one day quantum theory is superseded by something else, whatever. Suppose that one thing that happens in this, that does not happen in this theory is that correlations become signaling. Okay, so that whatever happens that will be more general in quantum theory will not allow us to send a message faster than light. And not to send a message at all, by the way. Huh? It's not, entanglement does not allow you to send a message at all, not faster than light. So um, could we still prove the security of cryptography in this scenario? So in other words, are all, the, all these claims that quantum theory gives security of cryptography, are they going to collapse as soon as quantum theory is slightly generalized or is it a robust claim? that we can say even if many features of quantum physics were not correct, it's enough to save a few of them to make sure that we still can do cryptography. And they answer that essentially, yes, um, it can be done. Uh, so the, essentially that this, this no signaling is uh, the core of cryptography. And now if you remember my historical diagram, you may say, well, what happened? Why didn't I draw a, a line between E92 and BHK E91 and BHK, I just, I draw the line like that. Well, this is a very interesting example on how when you have to reply to your referees, you better reply well. And they didn't, okay? So obviously, what happened in this case is that the referee said, hey guys, this sounds to me like the Ecker thing, right? What have you done new? And the guy replied, it is interesting to contrast the Ecker quantum key distribution protocol because there also a test of Bellion quality is performed they use a Bell inequality here. However, so it may appear as no locality, which is a word for the violation of Bell inequalities, is playing a crucial role here too. In this case, however, so in Eckert, 
the purpose of the inequality is to verify some shared entanglement, citing BBM 92. So essentially is to say we didn't understand it, right? And uh, we fear that if we, or maybe they understood it, but if we, f we fear that if we say that, oh yeah, yeah, that was what Eckert also had in mind, they reject our paper. So better say that we've done something revolutionary different from Eckert and Eckert did not get it, okay? So thanks to them, I was part of the team and Serge as well that made the statement for the first time. Otherwise they would have made it and then no glory for us, right? Okay, so this is just what happened, device independent key distribution at a glance. Many things happened since, uh, well, whatever you can read. There are f famous names that have solved some problems recently. Um, now you may say, well, do, can we implement device independent quantum key distribution? It's a bit tricky because to implement a device independent statement, you need to do a conclusive belt test, in particular to close the detection loophole. And this means that you have to minimize the losses. Now, quantum key distribution, by definition, is a task at a distance. There's no point in me doing quantum key distribution one meter away. In that case, I have a much faster way of distributing secret keys, okay? Just, just, just pass it. <laughs> at distance in optics means losses. Doesn't mean decoherence, it means losses. So, essentially, if you go to a sufficiently long distance, unless you have some trick there, the losses will kill your conclusive violation of Bellian inequality. So that's why uh, it's hard to implement and even the guys that have claimed to have done a loophole-free belt test have not gone further to demonstrate uh, implementation of device-independent key distribution. It can be done. It will be done at some point. I know that the people in Delft are working on it, but it's not going to be drastically, uh, let's say, order of magnitude. Beyond two kilometers, you are doomed in uh, fibers. In free space, can be a bit longer at least for the theorist, sorry Alex. Uh, <laughs> I, I know that there are losses also in free space. Um, okay, so that's the story I told you so far. Okay, well, uh, simplified, right? And so essentially all this mess arrives to device independent key distribution that is somehow the solution to the question I was asking. So now the violation of Bell inequality has a meaning, has an applied meaning, in particular it can certify in a device independent way without these assumptions of qubits, of measurements and so on, that we have security of cryptography. Now, this started a whole field called device-independent quantum information. And uh, if you go to any conference nowadays, you find some talks about, the, depending on the conference, more talks about device-independent. So what happened later? I will just go through quickly so on some uh, later developments. One thing that happened is device-independent randomness certification. You know that we have a grant on this here. Uh, some of you are paid by it. And... Um, now, this is a pretty much surprising statement to me. Another surprising statement that happened in this field, another nonlinear historical phenomenon, which is, you know, key distribution is distributing randomness at a distance, right? Now, if you can distribute randomness at a distance, in particular, you can generate randomness, right? You just forget about your partner and you have a random number, known only to your partner at best. So why does this come later than that? Interesting question, right? There is a reason for that. And uh, the reason is like this. Um, there were some ideas of generating random numbers with quantum physics before this field started. In particular, in the, around the year 2000, of course, first of all, it's obvious, right? Second, around the year 2000, both Gisain and Seilinger's group wrote papers and even patented the possibility of generating random numbers with quantum physics. The company De Quantique and some others are even selling them. This is a commercial product took from the internet. I don't know how much it costs, probably some 1,000 Singapore dollars. What is the problem here? Why this random generation did not take off while quantum key distribution was a super hot topic? Because to certify that this guy is you know, quantum key distribution is something you cannot do with classical means. You need quantum physics. To generate randomness, well, somehow you can do it with classical means. Just take a resistor, put zero current, and measure the thermal fluctuations, the voltage across the resistor. And you may say, oh, this is classical physics. Uh, there may be a deterministic model. Sure, go and compute it, right? Give me the prediction of the next fluctuation of that thing. So for all practical purposes, whatever you want to say, maybe it's not fundamental, it's not intrinsic, whatever, right? 
For all practical purposes, classical physics can generate randomness. And what's the, and what's the difference here? Well, in both cases, you need to open the device to see, oh, ah, there is a resistor here, and uh, I'm not, uh, it's not an antenna that is capturing the local radio, so it's really generated here by the terminal fluctuations. Okay, I trust it's random. Here you have to open the guy and say, oh, there is a beam splitter, and there are two detectors, but there's only one. It doesn't matter. Uh, and uh, ah, therefore, okay, this must be, uh, there's a laser here. Mm, yeah, fine, it looks like quantum, so I, I trust it's random. So you see, there is no real advantage. The only way you can get an advantage here is by essentially by buzzword claiming, say this is intrinsically random, your resistor in principle has a deterministic description. It's not so exciting, right? But device independent provides the quantum advantage. You cannot certify in a device independent way the randomness of a classical random number generator. So that's why, historical reason why, the explosion of research in quantum randomness happened after the device independent uh, the discovery or conceptual discovery rather than before. Okay, you cannot certify process randomness as technically called. It means that process randomness means that you don't certify the fact that your list looks random on, on statistical criteria, but you certify that what is happening is really a random process. It's the randomness of the process, not the randomness of the output. The other notion is output process. Okay, so we are the famous cartoon here that we show all the time, right? So uh, <coughs> this, is, this is perfectly accurate. As, as insofar as outcome randomness it goes, it's perfectly accurate that whatever list I give you, yeah, you can run statistical tests, but you can never be sure that it's actually random. Maybe it's just reading from a pre-existing disk that is just, you know, a couple of billions of digits, and you need to wait a couple of billion of digits before seeing the repetition of the code. Whereas with the violation of Bell inequality and suitable statistical discrimination, of course, you can, with a p-value, uh, with statistical confidence, you can certify that there is randomness being generated. Okay, so here we are. We are back here. The last thing I want to speak about is another development that is called self-testing, or device-independent self-testing. Again, a word that, well, we are using for uh, historical and... Uh, uh, meaning, but uh, some of you here in this room call it rigidity. Uh, it's the same. Uh, it could have been called blind tomography, and it would be the same. It turns out that Myers and Yao called it self-testing, and so we call it self-testing. Okay? And nowadays, it turns out these last few months, self-testing has become a hot topic, probably because all the others have been solved by, uh, by, by smarter people. And this comes from another popescu Orlich paper, and some other things that I would mention, and from this idea of Myers and Yao that I mentioned before that influenced also device-independent key distribution. Okay, so what's that thing? Uh, to explain what is self-testing, I will so first refer to a paper by Boris Tsereson that is a sort of review paper. This one is, doesn't prove a new theorem, but he reviews some theorems that proved in the past. And there is uh, some statement here. Let's just read uh, a couple of things. By the way, notice the abstract, right? That's the abstract four old and six new theorems without proofs, because it proved that somewhere, and 11 problems are presented. Okay. Great. Um, <laughs> and this is one of the theorems, or one of the consequences. I think it's pretty much self-explanatory what it is. Each state maximally violating the Bell CHSH inequality, you may know that this inequality is the one that gives two square root of two if you write it in the usual way, is essentially the same, in a way to be defined, as a singlet state for a pair of spin one half particles. Now, this is a very strong statement, you see. You have a statistical distribution, just probabilities. And these probabilities, up to something, essentially up to local definitions, okay? You don't know if it's a singlet as in up, down, minus, down, up, or if a singlet up, up, plus, down, down. That, that's the kind of thing you don't know, okay? But up to these local unitaries, that statistic criterion uniquely identifies the quantum state. Pretty strong statement. It doesn't tell you that there is security of cryptography, there's randomness, and so on. It's that state. However implemented, there is a qubit here, there's a qubit there, and they're maximally entangled, and we are measuring them. Beautiful statement. Now, look at the references. The, okay, Popescu Orlich 92, and then there is, very intriguing, right? SW87A, A, because there's a B, uh, page 2442. 
How many times do you see people citing a paper with a reference to the page? Okay, I'm reviewing some European projects I don't understand and I have to tell you that when they cited, uh, at some point they made a strong claim and they cited a paper, I went to look what it is, a review paper of 80 pages. Okay, I would have loved that they give me the page to which they are referring, okay? But here is not, so what's, why this guy, this guy bothers writing the page? Well, because it's not very easy to find that statement. Uh, it's a paper by Reinhard Werner, one of the best mathematical physicists around, and that's uh, the abstract. Whatever, I think Berge understands it, but few other people in this room may, 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 may understand what it is, excluded myself. And then the theorem that we are looking for is this one. So it's not a theorem, it's just a remark, because for, for Reinhard Werner, these things are trivial, right? <laughs> if chi is the square root of two, namely if CHSH is 202, the corresponding elements uh, of the sister algebra, whatever, form a relation of the Pauli spin matrices in A. The first equation, whatever, implies something, and this is precisely the case it is realized in the well-known address description of the ASPE experiment in terms of a single state, MC. So yes, they proved it. Yes, they are the first one to prove it. <coughs> yes, they missed the point. I mean, they didn't, they didn't stress how amazing it is. For them, it is a mathematical consequence of their theorem. They didn't stress how interesting this result is. Popescu and Rorlich, much more simple. They just state it like this. We identify the states of two particles. We issue the maximum evaluation of Bell inequality. They are straightforward extensions of the single state of two spinners. That's something a normal physicist like me can understand. But that's the statement, okay? So now you know what is self-testing. Um, okay, so self-testing is the idea that some quantum correlations uniquely identify the state. It's like a classical fingerprint for the quantum state. Of course, they must be very extremal, the state is going to be pure and so on, but okay, okay, we can discuss these things. We've worked a little bit on this here. Now, all these papers as focus on foundation. So nobody here, mentioned any possible connection with cryptography applications, uh, certification even, whatever. It just, we care what we can do with Bell inequalities. Even Werner wants to quant Bell inequality with field theories, okay? So really to say that the, the vacuum is entangled in, in algebraic field theories and so on. The other side of the spectrum is Maya and Yao, who actually invented device independent QKD before us, in fact, 10 years before us. They just didn't call it like that, and it was a little bit confused uh, for, again, for a normal person. Um, so what do they want to do? Well, let's see. So they say, well, there are some security proofs hanging around. Remember, Myers, Myers in 1998 has just produced the first unconditional security proof, but he already is a genius. This guy realized that there is some assumption there. And they say, well, it's supposed that the apparatus used by Alice to produce the photons is perfect. The purpose of this paper is to remove this last assumption by proposing and giving a concrete design for a self-checking source, which requires the manufacturer to provide certain tests. These tests are designed in such a way that if passed, the source is guaranteed to be adequate for the security of BB84 protocol, even though the testing devices may not be built to the original specification, essentially self-testing. Um, the motivation is only QKD. In fact, they don't even cite, I don't know if they noticed or not, they don't even cite the self-testing series based on CHSH. They don't mention Bell inequalities. The Meyer CL criterion is different from CHSH. It's a different set of correlations. They do violate some Bell inequalities, otherwise it would be wrong, but. Um, they wanted to do device independent QKD, but they end up with something stronger. They end up with self-testing, right? Which is more than, Q it really tells you the state. It doesn't tell you only that it's secure. And it's only for the ideal case. Now, the experiment I see in the room are getting nervous. Like, wh what do you mean, ideal case, an imperfect apparatus? Wh wh what does imperfect mean? Okay, now, for computer scientists, apparently, you can confirm, uh, Jamie or whoever else is here, uh, imperfect means not characterized. So, imperfect here does not mean that it doesn't work well, that there is noise and whatever. That's Gottesman, Low Lutkenhaus, Preskill, if you want the security proofs for imperfect apparatus, as I would call imperfect. For them, it means that it works perfectly, but you don't know how, okay? That's what he says. Even if the testing devices may not be built according to the real specification, if you get what you want, it's perfect already, just by seeing the correlations, okay? Again, self-testing. So don't be fooled by the idea it's imperfect. It's not a security proof with noise. It's a security proof 
without assumptions on the apparatus. And again, only for the ideal case, and then other people added the robustness and, and, and whatever. So just a quick uh, overview of what happened in self-testing in the last uh, years. Um, so these two tests, Myers and Young and CHSH, are two different ways of giving a classical fingerprint of the single state and of the measurements. So it's not only the single state, but you can also verify that the measurements that are done are complementary, like sigma x and sigma z. Again, you don't know if sigma x and sigma z, or can be sigma y and sigma x plus z, uh, can be rotated as you want, but they are complementary. And the state of the art of this field is that now we have uh, this kind of classical fingerprints for all pure bipartite states of any dimension, and for several multipartite ones, and the corresponding measurements, uh, there are robustness bounds, meaning if you don't observe exactly those statistics, but something similar to them, close to them, you can say how far you are from that pure state that you would have liked to create. Uh, there is still some optimization to be done here, but it's pretty okay. We can still test, ex we can test experiments with that. Um, but anyway, one thing that is nice on, on this result on all pure bipartite states, which can be interesting for some of you, is that you get this blind tomography with only three measurements on Alice and four on Bob uh, for any dimension. To have complete tomography, so knowing also the local observables, you need these square measurements or something of that order. Okay, so this is a, with fixed number of measurements, you can certify exactly the entanglement if the state is pure, of course. If the state is mixed, you can only give how far you are from the, the, that entangled state. So, I mean, it's not, it's not exactly the same thing as tomography, but it has interesting twist that maybe some people may want to implement at some point. And then, uh, yeah, uh, theorists, the uh, real theorists, like Thomas Vidic and uh, Joe Fitzsimons and others, uh, use self-testing as a primitive in a complex proof of certification of blind computing, okay? So the idea is I, I do many CHSH tests, I certify many singlets, and now I use these many singlets to test a quantum computer, uh, some gates and so on, and then I enchain these tests and ultimately I will be able to get some certification of the computer in one line. You can ask Joe for more specifications. So self-testing is a pretty neat idea that has been discussed. Uh, there's still something to do for multipartite states, improve the robustness, try more scenarios and whatever. So here is all that I wanted to tell you. There is here a box that says that we've done other things in the device independent field. There are something called dimension witnesses, uh, entanglement certification. Yeah, you can, you can, again, trivial, right? You can say how much entanglement is there in that system by violating and Bellion equality. You can do semi-device independence. You can say something like, okay, fine. I mean, I trust my thing is a qubit, but I don't want to trust the calibration of my measurements. You know, or uh, I trust that one of them is perfectly done, perfectly characterized, and the other one, we don't know anything. That's called steering, for those of you who know in the field. So there are, you can play with these intermediate scenarios. There's a beautiful paper by Stefano Pironio that we invited to AQUIS, and he's coming, uh, as far as I know. Uh, that is using not an assumption of fixed dimension, an assumption of average energy. So the, the assumption there is, um, let's assume that, uh, I, I don't know what measurement I'm doing, it, I assume it's light, and uh, you know, the average number of photons cannot be larger than 200. It makes sense, right? I don't know which dimension I'm encoding in that, but it cannot be many more than this number of photons. And then how, what kind of certification you can make with this? So you can play around with this relaxed assumptions, all the way to full tomography, which is I know my measurements, I know my, st I know my uh, system, the dimensionality, and I reconstruct fully the density matrix. That is interesting in itself, and are, as you know, there are some people here working on that. Okay, so that's the end. Uh, so just a summary. So what is the violation of Bell inequality? In a very simple uh, statement is that a certification that the results of the measurements do not pre-exist. On top of this, you can add a few layers of philosophy, but that's what it does. Uh, and then it has an applied side, is this device independent certification of devices. It started with QKD, we got randomness, we got self-testing, and a few other things. Okay, and with this I finished. Thank you for your attention.
coaching and stuff like this. So it doesn't mean that uh, we always have to find an applied science or something we do to be uh, recognized as scientists, or I always thought that science is something we do for the heck of it, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um. Okay, for the second question, you should ask the next director of CQT that uh, arguably is not in this room. Um, for the first question, of course, I agree with you, and that's the answer that I gave to. Uh, Werner or whoever was in Dansk that uh, asked me that question, but uh, um, how to say, I, at the same time, I mean, then the, the, the philosophical or the conceptual aspect here, it's a bit complicated to, I mean, some people like you and I like it, other people like it less, and I think I'm identifying, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm trying to pin it down why some people find that Berlin inequality somehow in that sense is, is sort of done, and I think the, it boils down to whether you want physics to tell you how nature does it or how we describe nature, right? If you want to say how we describe nature, if you, the task of physics is to describe, to, to help us give a description, a predicted description of nature, then quantum theory is perfectly fine and there's nothing to question. If you want, not yet, if you want to say how is nature doing it to try to get a mechanism, well there it's where the thing get messy, right? And then if you want to go into that or not, that's your and my problem, but uh, that's why, I mean, that, that side is uh, somehow open for discussion, right? Whether it's worthwhile studying Berlin inequalities and these kind of topics for their meaning, or we should just say, well, we have a generalized probabilistic theory called quantum theory that has all the features that uh, satisfy a satisfactory, that fulfill a satisfactory physical theory, and we work with it, right? No, but what I mean is, is there, isn't there a lesson that some wackos who work in topics of everybody just find that finally get... Some of them. Everybody now some of them. And when it happens for string theory, you, co you called me, right? Um, <laughs> I don't know. It, it, it's true that, I mean, we, I think we all agree, I hope, that, that it's not, one should not be penalized for working on something that is more speculative, that doesn't have immediate application, and so on. Now, this doesn't mean that every topic of that type will one day be vindicated, right? Uh, maybe some of them, of course, some of them, most of them will be vindicated by culture. Some of them will just prove complete pointless and a few will give rise to technologies. Yeah, whatever. Any other questions, comments, complaints? To <laughs> <laughs> uh, persons who are in this room, <laughs> or even more so to the speaker, Anybody who wants to, you know, make their contribution to a Bell uh, inequality talk? Anyway, I'm, I'm going to be here for 20 more years. If <laughs> I mean, so, uh, you have time to discuss. In that case, maybe we just, we just um, finish the formal part of that, of that colloquium. Uh, let's thank Valerio again for this nice overview. <laughs>